And it is one of sport's most prominent leaders to kick us off. A man currently navigating his league through this crisis and working out how to get back on the ice. That league is the National Hockey League and the commissioner is Gary Bettman. And I'm delighted to say that Commissioner Bettman joins us live from the United States now. A very good morning to you. Good morning. Uh, hope you and everybody watching are well, safe, and uh, looking forward to four days with you guys. Likewise, and, and thank you very much for, for being here. Let us start with the obvious question, and that is a status report really from you on how close we are to resuming the NHL season. Well, I, I don't think anybody has a fixed timetable, uh, particularly in North America right now. Uh, we have been working very hard since we took the pause on March 12th uh, to make sure that whatever the timing is, whatever the sequencing is, whatever physical ability we have in terms of locations to play, that we're in a position to execute uh, any or, or all of those options. Uh, there is still a great deal of uncertainty, and maybe I should take a step back. More important uh, than anything we plan the fact of the matter is the health and well-being uh, of the NHL family, our, our players, uh, our executives, off-ice people, and as importantly, our fans, is the most important thing. So, A, we've got to be mindful about uh, COVID-19 uh, from a health standpoint. And B, uh, before we come back, we have to make sure that our players are in game shape because we don't want them to come back off a long layoff. Uh, where they haven't skated and they haven't really been able to work out the way they are used to. Uh, we want to make sure they're ready to go, and we want to make sure we don't do anything that adversely affects the communities we play in. So everything that we're focused on starts with those two principles. It's obviously an incredibly complicated and, and fast-moving uh, situation. Take us inside the, the virtual scenario planning room at the NHL um, over the past few weeks. What has it been like for you at the head of the organization? How has the organization responded to this incredible challenge? Well, our organization at the league level, uh, as well as the organizations at our 31 clubs, as well as the Players Association, have been extraordinarily collaborative. Uh, we're all communicating on a regular basis, which is vital at a time like this. Uh, and we're exploring optionality. Uh, do we complete the regular season when we're given the opportunity? Do we do an abbreviated regular season because our competitive balance is so extraordinary, it's hard to tell how the season would have ended? Do we go right to the playoffs and on what form? And if we are not playing in front of fans, which at least in the short term seems unlikely, uh, do we do it in a centralized location and or locations? And if so, what places might be suitable uh, from a COVID-19 standpoint in terms of the communities that you're in and how big the outbreak is? And what is the availability of testing? And so that requires a collaboration with our medical advisors. And, and I believe that all of the major sports in North America are going through this same exercise. And, and while the, the medical and health issues are probably to some extent the same for all of us, the logistics of what we do and how we do it may be a little different depending on, on the sport. We need, if we're gonna play in a centralized location, to be in places that have a lot of ice because guys have to get back to skating you know, another sport may need fields, another sport may need courts, and different places have different abilities to accommodate those needs. How, how joined up have you been with your fellow major league commissioners over the past few weeks? What's the dialogue been like about those shared issues that you mentioned? We, we, we're, we're talking periodically, but as I just said, we all pretty much have to do our own thing after you get through the basics. Our, our medical people are talking, I believe, at least once a week and if not more. And I think it, at a baseline, there will be some joint protocol that we're all using, but our individual sports will necessitate differences in how that protocol's administered. But again, as I said, we're all basically focused on the same issues and that's health and well-being, keeping people safe uh, and trying to do the right things. And obviously to, to varying degrees, there are travel issues 
uh, 17% of our players, because we're so international or outside of North America. So before we can start up, we've got to get them back to North America. Uh, there are issues in terms of the borders and who can get in and out and what the issues are with respect to quarantining. Uh, and we have, you know, players all over the place in North America as well in terms of the other uh, 84, 83 percent. So well, the, these are issues that, that we've got to focus on. But again, if we're going to start up, the 17 percent of our players that are outside of North America have to come back. Now, you mentioned, obviously, that safety is the top uh, priority, uh, very understandably. Um, there's lots of talk across lots of different sports in all sorts of different parts of the world around um, whether it's right for professional athletes uh, to be tested um, over and above and before other people. Where do you stand at the moment on that debate? What's the situation within the NHL as regards player testing? Well, we haven't done any player testing other than for players who have been sick. Uh, before we went into quarantine, self-isolation, which is what our players have been doing, uh, we had a little outbreak principally on one team that had been traveling east back from California and the players who were infected, uh, I think it was five players on one team, were all on the same plane. Uh, we we um, Well, we were just getting to the good bit, weren't we? Uh, that uh, that was Gary Bettman. We'll try and get him uh, back uh, in a moment. Um, let's bring in James for a little instant bit of analysis as to uh, what uh, Commissioner Bettman was saying. Um, and it was a fascinating glimpse into exactly what it's like uh, to be a commissioner leading an organisation at an unprecedented time. Yeah, and safety and security seem to be absolutely paramount for him, as of course it should be. Uh, what struck you about those uh, those opening answers, David, as we fight the gremlins technologically right now? Yeah, I think it, it all seems uh, on the surface, very, very calm and measured uh, response. I'm sure behind behind the scenes, there's been um, you know lots of uh, meetings and discussions. The fluidity of the situation is something that has been coming across in all the conversations that we've been having with senior leaders across sport um, over the past few weeks. We've spoken to a lot of them on the uh, Leaders podcast, on the At Home With Leaders uh, series. And the number of different scenarios, scenarios and the rate at, the at which rate those, are, those changing are changing is uh, quite astounding, really. Yep. Uh, and uh, everybody, well, all senior figures across the world of sport, including Commissioner Bettman and no doubt Commissioner Garber, who's coming up a little later today, will have had eyes on Germany and the Bundesliga, um, which started this weekend. Maximum, I think, well, of 300 As you people. said, nothing could go wrong, right? I, I'm, I'm going, I've been cut off here, um, and I think we may have Commissioner Bettman back and ready to go. So I'm just going to get my skates on, I think. Yes. I, I, I wasn't ducking the question. Uh, as, as you said in the introduction, what could go wrong? <laughs> All of a sudden, I was staring at a blank screen. Anyway, the answer to the question is, obviously, unless there's an abundance of testing available, uh, and it can't be at the expense of medical needs, uh, we have to have that if we're going to move forward. I think all sports are going to need it. But again, the medical needs must take priority and there must be enough tests to satisfy what the medical community thinks its needs are and sports' desire to come back. Uh, I am told that there can be enough capacity and certainly over the next couple of months, there'll be more capacity, but that is a fundamental question and we certainly uh, can't be jumping the line in front of medical in front of the medical needs. Uh, moving to the the economic uh, situation, and it's very good to have you back, by the way. Um, Thank you. <laughs> uh, what's the impact for the league at the moment and into the future uh, of all of this? Well, obviously, uh, the revenues that we had in house for the season we have, but since March twelfth, uh, basically. Uh, revenues are not coming in uh, to any great extent. We're obviously not selling tickets to game. Uh, our media rights were large accounted for uh, in terms of payments by that point in time, but there may need to be credits and adjustments going forward. Uh, and we have a substantial amount of overhead uh, to keep our organizations intact. There have been some furloughs. There have 
furloughs. There have been some salary cuts. We at the league office uh, took uh, across the board pay cuts. Uh, it's a very difficult time because uh, any of our revenue models uh, contemplate ongoing revenues coming in, and that's not the case right now. But I'm optimistic that when things come back and we can play, things will ramp up quickly. Um, now, you mentioned earlier the, the prospect of playing games um, in empty arenas without fans. How are you approaching that particular scenario from a, a league point of view? There's all sorts of conversations in all sorts of sports, again, about um, enhancements to the broadcast, um, digital um, offerings that can be rolled out to try and compensate. Where are you on that right now? Uh, those are all things that our events and content people are working on. Obviously, technology will afford us some tools uh, to create, whether it's crowd noise or crowd experience live. Uh, from a TV standpoint, we may be able to put more cameras in more places because you're not worried about blocking uh, any fans' view that's in the arena. So we're going to be doing a lot of experimenting, uh, trying all sorts of technology. Uh, but first and foremost, we have to create for the players a game-like competitive condition, which means we're probably going to be in NHL buildings. Uh, we probably will need the capacity to play multiple games in the course of a day. And in, at least in North America, the NHL buildings are the best suited to do that. Uh, and we're looking at probably eight or nine different places where it will be possible both in terms of the arena. And when I talk about the arena size, it isn't obviously for the seating. It's the back of the house having multiple locker rooms. If you're going to play multiple games, we've got to be able to move teams in and out. We've, from a medical standpoint, we've got to be able to appropriately clean and sanitize the locker rooms after they've been used once. Uh, and so we're going to have a number of, as I said, eight or nine facilities that we can use in different places, which will depend on how active COVID-19 might be in that particular place the availability of testing as we discussed uh, and making sure there are enough other accommodations, including hotels, that we could ho host a dozen or so teams in one location. When they are allowed to do so, how confident are you that NHL fans will be willing to return to arenas? I, I think that NHL fans, when they feel comfortable, uh, either because we're doing the right social distancing and sanitary procedures, whether it's masks, uh, whether it's sanitizer, whether or not it's, it's a different seating configuration initially. I, I think fans are anxious to get back. Uh, and I also believe once the medical community has figured out the best treatment for COVID-19 and there's a prospect of a vaccine, I believe that sports uh, large gatherings will come back quickly because everything we're hearing from our fans is that they're anxious to get back. And we don't take that for granted, which is why we'll do what the medical people tell us is necessary and appropriate for us to do to bring fans back. And again, everything we do is going to be governed by the doctors, the medical people, and by governments at all levels, which will tell us what is and isn't appropriate for us to do. So a lot of our planning and a lot of the issues that we're confronting ultimately are going to be resolved for us by other people, whether it's physicians or whether it's it's governmental leaders. And that's why we have to be doing a lot of contingency planning so that we can react to whatever they're telling us is appropriate and permissible. Still a few minutes with uh, Commissioner Bettman. Do uh, send your questions in on the live chat if you would like to ask him something, just like David Finlayson, who has uh, this question for you, Commissioner. Uh, has the coronavirus changed the outlook on the 2021 season? And is it more important to complete this year or prep for next season? Uh, that, that, that's a great series of questions. Uh, we'd like to uh, complete this season. We'd like to award the Stanley Cup, the most treasured trophy, most historic trophy in all of sports. Uh, and our fans are telling us overwhelmingly that's what they'd like us to do because people have an emotional investment in this season already. Uh, and that's something I believe that we can do. And our players 
are telling us they'd like to come back and finish the season as well. And if that means we're playing over the summer, we can do that, not an issue. Uh, and if that means we delay the start of next season, and instead of starting as we normally do in October, we start in November or even December, that's all doable. We're committed to making sure that we have a full uh, 2021 season, uh, 82 regular season games and our usual playoffs. And if it means we have to shift the calendar a bit, we can do that. If you, if you look at us historically, we're over 100 years old as a league. Uh, we started in Northeast uh, North America and, and in the old days, air conditioning and ice making wasn't what it is now. Uh, we have teams in Florida. We have teams in Nevada, in Arizona, in Texas, in Southern California. We can play over the summer. So the calendar is becoming less a factor and can be more flexible in terms of how we move forward. Bit of history as well, in addition to why historically we played in the winter and in the Northeast. You know, the, there have only been two times the, that the Stanley Cup hasn't been awarded in 125 plus years. Uh, and one of them was in 1919 because of the Spanish flu. Indeed. Um, now, you, you have one of the, the most high profile jobs in world sport. Um, I wonder what, as a leader of an organization, as the leader of a sport, what have you learned about yourself during this uh, last few weeks, this crisis? We, we, we've had a number of situations that have been well chronicled where, where we've not operated uh, and, and have had to make alternate plans and relaunched ourselves. Uh, those typically arose out of work stoppages and we actually missed an entire season, but then came back to record revenues and record attendance, which, which was uh, no small feat. Uh, what we need to do is be consistent in terms of our vision, our communication, and ultimately our execution. And that requires coordinating uh, a, a great deal of information, both at the league level and with the clubs and with the players, and making sure we're keeping our fans informed so that they can feel connected to what we're doing as well. And in that regard, we have been working as tirelessly as we ever do, putting out tons of content on our traditional platforms, on social media platforms, uh, and giving our fans a chance to interact with our players and give our players a, fan, a chance to interact with our fans on a daily basis. And whether or not it's trivia shows hosted by one of our players, whether or not it's media calls, uh, whether or not it's showing old games that, that have commentary from players who played in it, we are constantly on a daily basis putting out new and more and more content to keep fans engaged, which we think is vitally important. So it's about communicating what our vision is and how we want to move forward, but also keeping people engaged on a daily basis. Just a couple of minutes uh, left with you, uh, Commissioner. Question from uh, Mark McCafferty. Uh, good afternoon, Mark. Thank you for being with us. Um, Talking about TV companies and your TV broadcast partners, how are they approaching the, the delays or potential cancellations of games? Um, and what's the dialogue like with them? Well, our, our, our partners are at the national level in North America are NBC and Rogers, and they've been great. They're anxious for us to come back. Uh, they've indicated great flexibility in terms of how we schedule when we're coming back, the format and, and the timing. Uh, and they're working with us to put out the content that I just talked about on the national level. The regional sports networks are doing the same thing. Uh, and we're very fortunate to have uh, great media partners that are, are working with us to make sure we stay connected with our fans. Final uh, question to you, uh, Commissioner Bettman. Um, we've got the industry uh, from around the world watching us uh, today. I just wonder, um, looking at the whole of sport and beyond the NHL. How optimistic are you about sport's ability to get through this crisis and thrive once again? Give us a rallying message, if you would. Uh, I, I am very optimistic and hopeful about the future. Sports has always been fundamental to bringing people together to enable places that have crises to heal. A good example of that was when our team launched in, in Las Vegas a couple of years ago after the shootings. Uh, sports 
really brings people together at times of great stress. Uh, and I believe that, that sports will come back and come back strong because sports is being missed. Uh, I think it will be easier for the major sports with the bigger followings. I think sports that, that are a little more fragmented or have different economic challenges may not be as fundamentally sound financially, may find it more challenging getting through this period. But I think the major sports and their franchises will get through this and will come back as strong as ever. It's just a question of timing. Good note on which to end. Uh, appreciate you joining us uh, this morning, uh, Commissioner Batman. Very good to see you. Thanks for having me, and I wish you a great conference.